everyone, Lucky here. Today I'm going to show you a way to create and detect particles of antimatter that you can do at home. I'll assume you already have a basic understanding of what antimatter is, but if not, I put a great video by the Thought Emporium in the description with some background info. The easiest way to make antimatter is by beta plus decay of the isotope sodium-22. Beta plus decay is a type of radioactive decay where a proton in the nucleus of an atom is converted into a neutron. In order to conserve charge during the interaction, it also creates and ejects a positron, which is the antimatter counterpart of an electron. It also creates and ejects a neutrino to conserve quantum number, but we won't be able to detect those since they're not charged. I chose to use sodium-22 because it only produces positrons and gamma rays when it decays. It also has a reasonably long half-life of 2.6 years and can be bought online without a license. I used a source with an activity of 5 microcurie, but found that this was creating way more particle trails than I wanted so a 1 microcurie source would work just as well. As a side note, it's also possible to have beta minus decay, where a neutron is converted into a proton and ejects an electron and antineutrino. It seems weird to me that a neutron can be converted into a proton plus some other particles, while a proton can also be converted into a neutron plus some other particles. How can we go back and forth between a proton and neutron and still have particles left over? This is because both of these processes convert some of the energy from the unstable nucleus into mass as it decays to a more stable, low-energy state, and that energy is used to create these extra particles. It's also possible to produce positrons directly from energy through a process called pair production, where an extremely high-energy gamma ray converts some of its energy into a positron-electron pair when in the presence of heavy atomic nuclei. I find this super interesting because it's creating mass out of energy alone, like reversing a nuclear explosion. I've been attempting to make positrons in this way by passing the 2.6 mega electron volt gamma rays emitted from a thorium oxide source through a 1 millimeter thick lead plate, but I haven't had any success with this method yet. Now that we have our positron source, we can use a Geiger counter to show that it's producing radiation, but how do we know what kind of particles are being radiated? One way is to look at the motion of the particles in a magnetic field. Any charged particle moving in a magnetic field will curve around the magnetic field lines due to the Lorentz force. The direction of curvature will be opposite if the particle is positively or negatively charged, and we can predict the radius of curvature if we know the momentum and the charge of the particle. This is why pictures of particle collider trails look like a spirally mess. The strong magnetic field lines help scientists identify which particle is causing each trail. I used the cloud chamber I showed how to build in a previous video to visualize the path of the radiated particles. A stack of two disk magnets in the center create a vertical magnetic field. The north end of the magnet is facing the camera, and I measured the vertical magnetic field strength on the surface to be about 90 to 185 millitesla with the field being stronger near the edge. Based on the change in energy during the decay process, we should expect to observe po positrons with kinetic energies up to 546 kilo electron volts, which corresponds to velocities of about 88% light speed. However, most of the particles we detect will have substantially less energy as they collide with air molecules and the source itself. Doing some quick maths, this means we should expect to see trails curving clockwise with a radius of 3.4 centimeters or smaller. The particle trails should also spiral inward as they slow down and create tighter curves. When I put the sodium-22 source in the cloud chamber, I can see lots of different particle trails. Some of these trails are definitely clockwise inward spirals, which means I can confidently say that they're positrons. But what about all these trails spiraling the other way? I suspect these are electrons ejected when the gamma rays emitted by the sodium-22 collide with air molecules. Some of them might also be due to background radiation or electrons caused by the high voltage electric field in the cloud chamber, but I think it's mostly due to gamma ray collisions, since they largely disappear when the source is removed. I also tried putting a strontium-90 source in the cloud chamber, which produces electrons through beta minus decay. This time, all the trails are spiraling inward counterclockwise, indicating negatively charged particles. I also tried a needle with some strontium-90 on the tip, which makes it a bit clearer where the, all the particles are coming from. We can prove that these trails from the sodium-22 are positrons and not some other positively charged particle by looking at the radius of curvature. This one, for example, starts with a radius of 2.9 centimeters, corresponding to a positron energy of around 424 kilo electron volts. The only other positively charged particles we should expect to detect would be protons or alpha particles, which are thousands of times heavier. Here's what an alpha particle source looks like. These trails don't noticeably curve, since the radius of curvature is much larger than the cloud chamber itself. In total, this project cost me around $195, including the cloud chamber. 
I put some links to the parts I used in the description if you want to try doing this experiment yourself. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned a thing or two about how to create and detect antimatter. In the future, if we can figure out how to manufacture and safely store large quantities of antimatter, it would unlock an immensely dense energy source that could revolutionize space travel. At the same time though, it would also allow for a new type of weapon that releases the entire mass energy of the material, instead of the small percentage released in modern fission and fusion bombs. So maybe it's a good thing that we're stuck with just a handful of antiparticles for now. Like and subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this one. See you later!